Right, so our next speaker is Diane Ganyuri. Hi, Diane. So, Diane completed a PhD under the supervision of Vanessa Guignuri at the École Normale Supérieure de Lyon, where she's now associate researcher. Her research focuses on the links between the representation of madness and issues of genre and gender in contemporary English literature, drawing mainly on works by Jenny Diskey, Janet Frey, Sarah Kane, Ian McEwan, Anthony Nielsen and Will Self. Diane has published several articles on madness and gender in the fiction of Janet Frey and Jenny Diskey. She's also worked on Diskey's short stories in a literary translation workshop for master students and hopes to keep tra translating her writings into French while further studying them. Diane's paper today is entitled, This is a Place of Madness, Borderline Stories in Jenny Diskey's Monkey's Uncle. Thank you. Thank you so much for the introduction. Um, first of all, I'd, I'd like to thank Ben for organizing such a wonderful event and including me. I'm truly happy to be able to celebrate such an inspiring writer and honored to do it with such stellar speakers. I'll start this paper with a few words by Jenny Diskey herself, who stated, and I quote, I don't feel compelled to tell comfortable stories. Should her stories be defined as uncomfortable, their disturbing or disruptive quality might not spring merely from subject, but from structure and style as well. What one critic refers to as the liminal ethics of her postmodern fables hints at Diskey's predilection for an aesthetics and an epistemology of the in-between, as well as her propensity to defy, even defeat, conventional categorization. Her sixth novel, Monkey's Uncle, is arguably the most liminal of all her fables, one I've chosen to call a borderline story, both for its focus on mental illness and its depiction of madness as closely interlinked with crossing boundaries and mapping border spaces. A few weeks after the fall of the Berlin Wall and the death of her daughter in a car crash, Charlotte Fitzroy, genetic researcher and former political activist, as she's introduced in the narrative, is found naked in her garden, pulling up the plants. This breakdown sends her not only to a mental hospital, but also aboard the ship which carried her presumed ancestor to the coast of South America and to a wonderland inspired place of madness, I quote, whose inhabitants, including Marx, Darwin and Freud, all surrender to serendipity. Mirroring the split in its protagonist's mind, the narrative itself splits into three very distinct yet complementary stories on the border and of the border. And these stories offer fertile grounds for an interrogation of the boundaries set by rationality with sexual and textual delimitations as a central focus. Monkey's uncle charts a voyage into madness that moves from borderline to borderland so as to exploit the full potential of liminality and offer a playfully serious subversion of established categories of gender and genre in particular. To start with, of all the voices heard in Monkey's Uncle, Lewis Carroll's is first and foremost. Each chapter borrows its title and epigraph from Alice's Adventures in Wonderland and Through the Looking Glass. And what's presented on the very first page of the novel, I quote as Charlotte Fitzroy's descent into madness at the age of 49, does take her through a looking glass of sorts to this Wonderland inspired underworld where boundaries are crossed and blurred various rules reversed and archetypal representations of madness revisited. It's no coincidence that Charlotte's agitated mind reaches its breaking point precisely while she's looking, if not at her own reflection in a mirror precisely, at another face that reflects her own. Uh, that, an over, that, sorry, of an orangutan at the zoo through a, a thin sheet of reinforced glass. And this will be the first quote. On the next slide, yes. Uh, while she's mesmerized by the connection between herself and the ape, she, I quote, loses her footing amid the treacherous minutiae of her thoughts and finds herself falling headlong through a gaping hole that has suddenly appeared between the one side of one thing and the other side of the other. Decompensation, the psychiatric term for the onset of a psychotic episode, 
is described here using at least two stock images of insanity, loss of balance first and second, a split or a crack now most commonly associated with schizophrenia. Although Charlotte is never officially diagnosed with anything other than depression, she does seem to exhibit, in the words of anti-psychiatrist R.D. Lane, the cracked mind of the schizophrenic, as yet the next quote demonstrates. Mentioning, as you see, the fraction of Charlotte's mind left behind to negotiate for her in the world. To paraphrase Lane, Charlotte's self is now divided into, on the one hand, the still rational and reasonable, all by depressed, Charlotte up there or up top, as she's called in the narrative. And on the other hand, her mad alter ego called in turn, Charlotte the decidedly demented, Charlotte the deserter, Charlotte the crazed or Charlotte the mad. This division or perhaps here more accurately multiplication of the self echoes in literature what psychiatry refers to as multiple personalities. However, considering Disky's avoidance of medical terms or labels and the overwhelming use of madness or illness in the narrative, schizophrenia as a prism may only be useful not as a specific condition, but as one expert puts it, as the quintessential madness. That is, a blueprint for the literary depiction of experiences of insanity where the, etym the etymological crack in the mind, schizophrenia, allows for an opening, a passage, where this dialectical hole that Charlotte stumbles into has her crossing to other landscapes or another place to be, as the narrative describes, and what Michel Foucault would call other spaces. This explains why she deems madness perfectly delightful, as you see in the next quote. She applies the very same terms to her fall, which leads to a state of elation instead of fear. In fact, her entire description hinges on what would usually be called an oxymoron, and it openly and reflexively defeats all expectations. In a passage overflowing with liquid consonant, as you can see, both words and sounds emphasize how liberating the experience is. Madness is shown to exert a subversive, exhilarating power over both language and space, reversing or discarding core rules and principles. Namely here, accuracy on the one hand and gravity on the other. Crossing into another space frees Charlotte from the constraints of reality and rationality and allows her and the reader to discover and to explore what lies on the other side or on the underside. This place of madness that's also introduced as limbo park, therefore inherently liminal, which will be my next point. The kinship between insanity and liminality is not only sanctioned by the name of this other space Charlotte reaches, but by its very nature or location as well. She finds herself, I quote, standing on the grassy bank of an ornamental lake. So she's no longer just on the borderline, but in a borderland. Perhaps inevitably, both terms, borderline and borderland, have breached barriers between disciplines, crossing over from spatial studies to psychiatry and vice versa. The borderland was originally a metaphor in Darwinian psychiatry, describing a shadowy territory between sanity and madness. A territory which modern psychiatry seems to map as that of borderline syndrome, halfway between neurosis and psychosis, an in-between space still. As Disky's novel demonstrates, borderline stories necessarily unfold in borderlands, spaces that connect rather than separate. All kinds of boundaries come under erasure in the world of madness, as represented by Disky, as inner and outer space, past and present, or human and animal become conflated. To guide Charlotte in this actualized place of her imaginings or playground of her mind is an orangutan whose name significantly is Jenny, just like the apes studied by Darwin at the London Zoo and, of course, the author herself. Jenny's ability to speak brings down the main barrier between apes and humans, just like the presence of three old men who turn out to be Marx, Darwin and Freud invalidates usual distinctions between temporalities by fusing them together. Another feature of this liminal space is its instability or mutability. When Charlotte mentions her taste for the seaside, the landscape changes in an instant. She and her companion find themselves no longer walking along a lake, but I quote, a shingle beach beside a gray northern sea. 
And moments later, the pebbles are replaced by sand, the sun breaks out, and the sea turns Mediterranean blue. Such landscapes are far more than a backdrop to borderline stories, whether on a ship, a bank, a beach, in a garden, or even by a door. Every moment of significance, every insight into the formation of identity, the meaning of life, or the value of knowledge in the novel takes place in a borderland of sorts. Representing madness allows Disky to conduct an exploration of the boundaries of rationality, charting spaces in between, and exploiting their potential for the recombination and reconfiguration of knowledge, which will be the, the next point. Charlotte's breakdown is undeniably the climax of her own identity crisis, but also the breakdown of certain theoretical and ideological paradigms and an overly partitioned classification system, as is made clear from the very first chapter, as you'll see in this next quote. So by favoring the borderlands of madness over the borderlines put up by Cartesian rationality, and by breaking epistemological and narratological boundaries in a novel that is framed in between discourses, Disky is able to interweave the individual and the universal, the experimental and the experiential, um, the scientific and the literary and entertainment and examination, all in her sustained questioning of our conception and classification of phenomena and identities. Because Monkey's Uncle requires suspension of disbelief as a fable, but also suspension of belief as a postmodern variation, the novel exhibits characteristic skepticism towards grand narratives and disrupt uh, traditional categories. As I've said of genre and genre in particular, I will start with genre. Um, as the incubate makes clear, Monkey's Uncle is to no small extent a book about a book. Precisely Fitzroy of the Beagle, a biography of Vice Admiral Robert Fitzroy, who was mainly known for being the captain of the ship which took Darwin on his famous voyage to South America. Once Charlotte picks it up at a secondhand bookstore, she never seems to put it down again, and she keeps reading and rereading it throughout her stay at a mental hospital. Capitalizing the R in her surname as well, she becomes first convinced that Fitzroy is her ancestor, and second, obsessed with his story, which to her is key to deciphering her own. More than a mere object, however central to the main narrative, the book acts as a gateway for readers in and outside the novel. Just as Charlotte's reading transports her into the captain's life, so the reader is immersed into yet another universe, following one more path, branching out for chapter one. As mentioned above, um, the novel interweaves three different narrative threads or three different borderline stories, unfolding in three alternating series of chapters. And thus, from one chapter to the next, the reader hops from an account of Charlotte's breakdown, treatment and recovery, which as a narrative conforms to the norms of realism, psychological realism in this case, to a fictional transposition of a historical character's biography, blurring the lines between fact and fiction, and finally to this carolesque story, borrowing from miscellaneous genres, from fantasy and nonsense literature, to the absurd or the novel of ideas. Thus, the novel intercuts genres of fiction, creating such systematic and ultimately seamless circulation between them that any rigid delimitation is exposed as artificial. While references to stories or storytelling abound in the novel, um, the text predominantly uses generic terms, such as stories or books, instead of genre-specific terms, which are used only twice to mention, I quote, the finale of a fairy story, and second, rereading a novel. This clearly chimes in with Disky's approach to her craft, which is very well described, I find, by critic Robert Hanks, when he stresses both the versatility of her output and her offhanded dismissal of traditional literary classification, when she says, I quote, it's all writing. Disky's characters and her readers, therefore, get to experience the dynamism and the diversity of a borderland, which is both a micro and a macro structure in the novel. This heterogeneous palimpsest of a borderline and borderland story is in itself a liminal space, which dismisses labels, disregards lines, and thus enacts a relentless questioning of the limits and the relevance of genre classification, as well as a remapping of textual identities. 
Such questioning also applies to categories of gender, which will be my final sub point. Everything about Charlotte Fitzroy seems to amount to an assault on the boundaries usually enforced by patriarchal systems between men and women, their delimitation and definition of gender. And of course, her spell of madness, and as we know, and as was reminded yesterday, the link between women and madness has been um, established and commented uh, by feminist uh, literary theory, among others. So her spell of madness further enhances such deviations and transgressions. As a genetic researcher, Charlotte works in, thus infringes upon, the male-dominated world of science. As a political activist and militant feminist, she resists both confinement to passivity and exclusion from the public sphere. Her relationship with her children is one of disaffection rather than affection, which runs counter to the idealization of motherhood and motherly love. Her refusal to become a wife and her relief at the untimely death of her lover as a young woman disrupts stock narratives of familial bliss and romantic love. Now, I quote, a middle-aged woman who has let herself go, she refuses to abide by the dictates of a femininity consistently and diversely exposed as a construct. The, the common phrase, let herself go, is repeated several times throughout the narrative and italicized in its first occurrence, as Charlotte's son, Julian, contemptuously stares down at his unkempt mother, and I quote, a long time since she had let herself go, and whatever it was that goes had gone, leaving a visibly overweight, somewhat shapeless and decidedly untidy woman to get on with it. Such emphasis here has a denaturalizing effect, drawing critical attention to an expression whose often mindless use may well obscure a certain degree of meaninglessness. The italics also lend it a certain alien quality, of course, they signal a shift to Julian's point of view, but they also inscribe these words as if they belonged to a foreign language. This is only the first of many subversive discursive strategies used to address stereotyped representations of women and men and their behavior in the novel's framing narrative, which is indeed framed in between discourses from everyday language to biology, psychoanalysis or women's magazines. Resorting to yet another extremely vague euphemism, Julian is quick to blame his mother's behavior on biological factors he will not specifically name. I quote, don't women of her age often start to go funny? Can't you give her something, hormones or whatever? While later on in the narrative, a young female editor lectures Charlotte on, I quote, the biological time bomb. A friend of Charlotte laid daughter Miranda's, Elaine, works at Herself magazine, and she advertises, I quote, this is the full slide is on the, the full quote is on the next slide, sorry, that the magazine runs a lot of articles about the psychological tensions between having fun and having a family, but tends to come down firmly on the side of being settled, since in the end, that's what most women want. The trivialization of any occupation other than being a wife and mother and a concluding statement that poses forcefully as universal truth are both reproduced and ridiculed once Charlotte makes her final assessment of Elaine. And I quote, and this idiotic girl in a foolish hat was turning her into who? Mother Teresa? Mother Earth? Mother of God, Charlotte thought. Please make her go away. Desanctifying a holy trinity of female archetypes allows for a dismantling of well-known and here worn out associations between womanhood and motherhood, sacrifice, care, and nature, to name but a few. As for this foolish hat mentioned here, it's featured more than once in the novel for the sake of caricature, and it reappears as one of Jenny's unexpected adornments. This is, yes as one of Jenny's unexpected adornments, sorry, in the absurdist borderland of Charlotte's madness. You have this full introduction here in this quote. Among her many functions in Monkey's Uncle, Jenny is literally aping a femininity entirely based on appearances and etiquette, entertaining as it is undeniably. Jenny's performance um, exposes femininity as just that, a performance resonating with the performativity of gender as theorized by Judith Butler. And Butler reconceptualizes the body as I quote, a variable boundary. Disky's borderline stories paint a complex picture of gender identity and relations, featuring characters who at times conform to and at other times conflict with 
traditional expectations and assignments. They also allow for reconfigurations, as is the case, albeit briefly, for Charlotte's son. Julian's eventual outburst to his mother, revealing the weight of years of emotional neglect, contradicts the early assertion by his mother that he was, I quote, born cold, and explains why he so enthusiastically embraced the patriarchal values that Charlotte was so determined to fight. So this is his um, statement on the next quote. Thus, such moneyed masculinity is far from precluding vulnerability. And the narrative significantly describes um, this climactic moment between mother and son as a crossing of both gender and genre boundaries. I quote, it was as if some spell had been broken, a princess kissed and come alive. So by the end of Monkey's Uncle, readers may feel as Charlotte does when recalling her initial experience of insanity. And I quote, as if a concealed door has suddenly opened to a new and undreamed of wing of a familiar house, leaving the occupant with a memory of an arrangement of rooms which could not, in all architectural reason, exist. As temporary inhabitants of the novel's Places of Madness, we are offered glimpses of rearrangements or reconfigurations of our epistemological space, and we're encouraged to rethink the architecture of knowledge in a way that leaves room for more than the strictly rational. The novel's constantly renewed ode to spaces in between and the final celebration of, I quote, conclusions which never could, would or should be conclusive, call for openness and fluidity in the recharacterization of textual and sexual identities and in all fields and forms of classification and creation. Disky's borderline and borderland writing thus fosters a poetics and a politics of liminality. Thank you for listening. <laughs>